Welcome everyone to our event today, um, our, uh, the book talk on the Manitoba Muslims, a history of resilience and growth. Um, I'm going to uh, begin first with a land acknowledgement. Um, while I myself live and work in Toronto, our, our guest today, uh, and um, perhaps maybe even some audience members today, uh, live in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So this like, land acknowledgement is meant for both territories. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge the lands on which um, the University of Toronto and the city of Winnipeg operate. For thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the, of the Credit. Winnipeg is located within Treaty Number 1 territory. The traditional lands are the Anishinaabe, the Cree, OG Cree, Dene, and Dakota, and is the birthplace of the Métis Nation in the heart of the Métis Nation homeland. We um, also acknowledge that these lands have been stolen from its caretakers and we acknowledge our own role as settlers in continuing the legacy of colonial violence and genocide. We acknowledge that for some racialized non-Indigenous peoples, coming to Turtle Island was not a choice. So again, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Mosca and I work at the Institute of Islamic Studies at the University of Toronto. Specifically, I am the archivist for the Muslims in Canada archives and I can I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, I wanted to go over really quickly uh, um, the basically the outline for today's event. Um, we'll begin with some introductions. So I'll give a brief introduction to the Muslims in Canada archive. Uh, the book that we'll be discussing today, and of course, um, the wonderful author of the book, uh, Mr. Ismail Mukhtar. From there, I wanted to invite Ismail to talk about the book in his own words. Uh, we'll discuss the book's creation itself after that, because I have a few questions for him. And um, finally, the last 15 minutes will be for any of the anybody in the audience to ask questions as well. So we'll have a short um, uh, Q&A. Uh, near the end and then uh, the very very last thing um, we'll have a slide on, about like on our um, that shows all our contact information as well as the website um, uh, for the book as well. So as I mentioned previously I'm the archivist for the Muslims in Canada archives or MICA for short which is a collaborative and participatory initiative at the Institute for Islamic Studies um, and it provides a platform for the missing um, for missing Muslim voices in Canada. Um, MICA acquires, organizes, preserves, and makes accessible records of and about Canadian Muslim individuals and organizations that possess enduring value for the preservation of the history and documentary heritage of Muslims in Canada. Since this past summer, uh, MICA has been hosting a series of webinars called uh, the community collaboration series where we where we're using our platform to share community archive projects that exist out there and uh, public history initiatives as well so um, this is precisely why we knew we had to hold this book talk on manitoba muslims a history of resilience and growth uh, so the book itself um uh, is both, uh, so I wanted to actually, this is a, a little bit of a description of the book. Um, so the book is uh, both a look back at the history of Muslims in the province of Manitoba and a look back uh, and a look forward into the future. The Muslims of Manitoba have a presence that reaches back beyond a century. They are a fast growing demographic and continue to make many positive contributions to the community and country. The history of Manitoba Muslims is an integral part of the history of Manitoba and Canada. With a better collective understanding of our history, all Canadians can work together to create a more respectful, tolerant, and welcoming nation. And finally, of course, my guest today is the author of this wonderful book, Mr. Ismail Mukhtar. I'm going to uh, first read a short biography, um, if, if you don't mind. Uh, so Ismail Ibrahim Mukhtar has been one of the key leaders of the Manitoba Muslim community for over three decades. His extensive and wide ranging community contributions include serving as pre president of the Manitoba Islamic Association, vice president of the Muslim Student Association, 
editor-in-chief of the Manitoba Muslim Magazine, volunteer imam and counselor. He is an Islamic scholar, regularly lecturing and writing on Muslim issues. Mukhtar lives in Winnipeg with his wife and three children. He's a chartered professional accountant. Welcome, Ismail. We're so happy to have you here today to talk uh, about your book. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so with that, um, I think we can, we can get started uh, with some of the uh, themes and discussion topics uh, I had in mind. So first of all, I was hoping uh, you could, you know, briefly use or give us a description of the book in your own words. Um, you know, anything you wanted to, to mention about the book, like I, I already read the, um, the kind of the official book description, but if, uh, I, but I'd love to hear what, yeah, what you have to say about the book as well. Hey, uh, I guess first I greet everybody and thank you for the invitation and uh, I'm really happy and excited to share some of uh, my reflections on my recent book, Manitoba Muslims. Uh, now, if I was to say anything about this book, it is the first book in its kind in a sense that this is the first attempt to write the history of Muslims in the province of Manitoba. Uh, the book is about 380 pages. And uh, in a way, it's a book of history. Uh, and in other ways, it's also a book that uh, analyzes and discusses uh, community issues, struggles, and, uh, and, and, and problems. So it's a mix of both. So the first part of the book presents a chronological history of the community beginning from the 1900 all the way to 2020. And I have divided that section into different sections. And then the second part of the book is basically talks about the issues and the struggles of the community, uh, talks about internal conflict, uh, youth, uh, women, converts to Islam, uh, Islamophobia, uh, the different affiliations that uh, Muslim community members have. So, you know, and, 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 and a discussion uh, within the historical context. Uh, and then the, the, the last chapter is basically a future outlook uh, based on all the historical discussions uh, that I presented in earlier chapters. So that in a nutshell uh, describes the, the book. Uh, okay, thank thank you, thank you for that. Um, I, in the in that case, I can go into like my very my one of my biggest bigger questions for you is um, why you wrote the book. Um, why do you, do you personally feel it is significant aside from it being? Um, it's obviously one of uh, uh, like uh, one of a kind, uh, the first of its kind from uh, definitely from Manitoba's Muslim history, but. Uh, why do you personally feel like this uh, this kind of history needed to needed to exist? Um, well, I guess as you mentioned, the history I mean the history of Muslims in this province was not systematically recorded or written down, and uh, I noticed that uh, being a long timer in the community, many of the early pioneers and elders of the community who came in the nineteen fifties they were getting older and their memory was fading and uh, many of them have passed away. So basically I felt that history will be lost if we do not document uh, the, the history and you know, get as much information from them. So you know, a sense of urgency that you know, we have another chapter that will be lost. We have lost another ch a chapter before, then now we will be losing another chapter. So I think that was a main drive to capture the history before the early pioneers, you know, all of them disappear. Uh, so that was one reason. The second reason is I myself have been involved in the community from day one, different projects and in different undertakings. And 
and I know the ins and the outs of the community. So I felt a sense of responsibility that you know what I have experienced and what I have seen and what I have witnessed, I have to share it with the new generation of Muslims and also the, the newcomers. We are a community that receives a large inflow of uh, immigrants every year. So uh, people like me who have been here a long time have a responsibility to share with them their experience. So uh, because of that, I thought, you know, I, I have something in my shoulder and I have to, to write something about it. And then being somebody who is passionate about history, that was also another factor that helped me undertake this project. Does that mean that you um, that you've done something similar before? Have you written uh, histories before? Not a book, but I do read a lot in history. I have some articles in history and uh, and lectures also, but th this is the first book. Okay, so speaking of um, the uh, the elders that you were talking about. Um, uh, I, I assumed that you did interview some of them, or at least their descendants anyway. Um, and uh, my question for you is um, how you got connected to these, uh, these, uh, these people and, you know, how did you, how did you choose them? I'm just, okay, so obviously you're, you're very well, uh, um, you know, you're deep in this community yourself you've done a lot of community work um in the in the in manitoba in general um so i'm assuming some of your connections probably came from that but i guess i'm wondering um how you chose who and you know how long did it take for you to interview them and um how was the interview process like what did you how did you feel about it okay well, I guess for the first chapters, I had to rely a lot on the seniors and the older people in the community. Now, not all of them were in Winnipeg. Uh, some of them have moved to, to different places in North America. So I began with those who are around and started to gather as much information as possible. But at the same time, also those who are still around were helpful in connecting me with those who left uh, the province. So through them, I was able to reach uh, some of the, you know, key founders who are now in Toronto. Some of them are even in the US. So I was able to reach out to them. So starting locally and then went uh, beyond the, the province to interview them and, and, and connect with them. Of course, mostly was uh, through emails. Some of them preferred phone calls. Now, the challenge was uh, the elder uh, generation was uh, their memory was somewhat shaky. Uh, so someone would say something, another person would say something. I mean, just to give you an example, uh, one question about when was the, the first mosque in the province open? So somebody said 1975, another person said 1976, one said it was an Eid al-Fitr, another person said it was an Eid al-Adha. So I have to find something tangible. And by researching the local uh, newspapers, then I was able to confirm the date. So yeah, so it, it was somewhat uh, challenging, especially interviewing the, the, elder, uh, the elder population, but it, it was a starting point. Uh, in terms of the community issues, for example, the youth, uh, women, and so on and so forth, uh, of course, I, I, I knew, for example, the youth leaders. So I reached out to them. I sent a survey and interview and, 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 and also the same thing with women, uh, you know, the active women and the women who were involved in different uh, leadership positions in the community. So. A combination of that was was definitely very helpful uh, for my for my research. Um, um, was there anyone that you wanted to interview but you couldn't? Uh, maybe they said no, or maybe you couldn't find them, or something like that. Yeah. Well, some of them were really old. Uh, for example, the first president of the Manitoba Islamic Association in 1960 is still alive and. Uh, and unfortunately, not many people knew that he was the first president. Um, and, and, and that's the problem we have because of all the newcomers 
all the history is forgotten. So I, I myself didn't know that. So I tried to reach out to him and uh, I realized that he was not, uh, I mean, basically he lost his memory and uh, he was not able to, to provide any information. Uh, similarly, also, uh, there was an individual who probably was the first to study in the University of Manitoba uh, from the 1950s, and uh, he, he was in uh, Saskatchewan, and uh, I managed to get his contact, but I was told that he's, he was too ill, and uh, he, didn't, uh, he didn't survive long. So I was hoping to reach to these kinds of people, but unfortunately, uh, I wasn't able, uh, and if I was able, probably I would have been able to get some useful information from them. Yeah. So, so uh, what I'm essentially hearing is exactly what you said. Like, the, there's a race against time here to to get the you know, you know to talk to the elders and get um, as much information as possible. Um, I, I'm assuming that if the elders. Um, uh, it, you know, if, if they had passed away, you then obviously you went to their next of kin and you talked to their their descendants, their children. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, was there some uh, was there some similar difficulties there? Like uh, I'm assuming maybe they wouldn't know too much information, or they couldn't give you as much de detail as you as you wanted. Yeah, I mean they were helpful in terms of providing uh, photos, for example. Uh, maybe some documents that were left uh, at home, uh, but not everybody I approached was uh, was forthcoming. Uh, some of them just ignored my email, and then I guess that's what every researcher would go through. Some of them would say, yeah, we will try to find you something, and then uh, you remind them again, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll send it to you, and then it never happens. But overall, I think I, I, I got good uh, cooperation was uh, the, from the families and most of the photos that you see in my book, I was able to collect from, from those families. Um, so um, another question I had was, um, so you talked about in your preface that obviously you interviewed people for a lot of the, the information, but you also got information from um, you know, news, newspapers as well as um, online archives. I, I, and I'm wondering if you can uh, clarify what you mean by online archives and um, were they the online like newspaper uh, archives or are they separate? Yeah, so the archives of the uh, library, for example, the, the main library in the, in, the, in the city, they have lots of oh. archives, lots of information. Mm -hmm. uh, also newspapers, uh, it's all online and it's all archived and that was very helpful. Now the local newspaper uh, searching through them was a hit and miss because uh, I searched by Islam, by Muslim, by Mohammedans, by Syrians, by Assyrians. You just keep trying and trying and trying. And I think I was able to get a substantial amount of information from going through the, the archives of uh, the newspapers. But as I said, it was a hit and miss uh, because they were they are not consistent when they refer to Muslim. Uh, Muhammad and the spelling is not the same. Sometimes it's, it's Muhad, sometimes even uh, for Syrians. So that, that, that was definitely a challenge. But but other than that, I think the archives of the, uh, the, the libraries and the, the local newspapers were very helpful. I was able to find lots of information. And, uh, you know, one thing we didn't know uh, is that, for example, uh, a renowned personality, Yusuf Ali, who's a tra the English translator of the Quran, he visited Winnipeg in 1932. I mean, he was officially invited. And again, he came in 1938 on his way to opening the Rashid Mosque in Edmonton. Now that piece of information, I was able to find it by digging deep into those uh, archives. So those archives were, were helpful and, uh, and I did use them extensively. Um, so, um... Sorry, I sorry I lost my train of thought. But so um, so you 
you did you did interview people um yeah, newspapers but also you did also talk uh, get a lot of your records from the manitoba islamic association as well um do they have uh, I mean, i'm just i guess i'm kind of curious to know how their record keeping is how you know how how much they had and how, how much um uh how useful they were as well and you know what kinds of records they might have had that helped with the book yeah the, the their publications were very helpful and as i noted in the book i was the editor of the main magazine the manitoba muslim magazine for two years and I have, uh, you know, the, the, the archives at home. So that was a very helpful resource. But beyond that, the Manitoba Islamic Association, uh, I mean, they do have some records, but unfortunately it wasn't organized. So it just boxes upon boxes and then, uh, you know, filtering through them is, is, is not, it's not the easiest thing to do. And I think that's where I see a major failure, failure when it comes to our communities and Islamic institutions. I don't think we are doing a good job of archiving our documents. So whatever is available in the association, I was able to go through it, but it wasn't easy. It's not systematically archived, archive is just boxes upon boxes and uh, I have to dig and find my way. But the other thing is also a good section of the documents of the association from the 1960s is, is, is basically lost because what was happening was you have the secretary, for example, will be taking minutes and he will be keeping those minutes at home and just, you know, put them in the boxes in the basement. So people were keeping those important documents in their homes rather than systematically uh, archiving them in the in the central location in the association and, and one thing surprising i found i reached out to one to a person who's now in edmonton who was secretary of the association for probably from the 50s and when i called him he said you know i wish you called me a few weeks earlier you know i had a dozen of boxes here i mean half a dozen of boxes here and uh, I didn't know what to do with it, and I just dumped it all. And I, I was really, I, I felt very, very, uh, you know, I, I was shocked. And, and another person I reached out, he told me I had the many boxes with documents. I just kept whatever I felt was relevant to me, and I, I threw, I, I dumped everything else. So, you know, not having that kind of uh, systematic way of archiving was, was very unfortunate. and. Uh, you know, that way we are losing a lot of documents. Yeah, um, that that is, as an archivist, that really, that really shocks, shocks me, the dumping of, the dumping of records is very unfortunate. Um, I'm assuming that I, I, I guess that a lot of the, the gaps that were, didn't exist in um, the, the records that you saw, um, you found a lot of that information through the interviews. And that's, that's likely how a lot of and I mean, that's a that's a general trend in, in archives uh, in any public history initiative. Um, you know, we go to to the people and listen to their stories to fill in any gaps that records can't um, uh, can't uh, can't or don't ca capture. Yeah. Um, actually, I, so um, I wanted to move on to another another question um, uh, about the audience for your book. So I found it very, uh, um, very fascinating that you uh, you know, you try to make it um, make the book. Um, you know, you try to cater the book to a wide audience. So, um, you, I, I, I love that you mentioned in the preface that you know, um, you that you know yourself that the Manitoba Muslim community wants the gritty details, the 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 specifics, um, but that you also know that. Uh, um, the non-Manitoba Muslims want a more broader, broader history book. So I'm wondering how you chose, um, how you chose this, uh, this, this big audience, these two audiences, and how you, how the book uh, caters to both audiences. Yeah, it, it wasn't easy. It, it was challenging, and I'm sure uh, some members of the community who have seen the book, uh, I mean, nobody said anything to me, but I, I would assume there will be some who might be disappointed because 
they didn't see as much uh, detail about either their contribution or the contribution of so and so. But uh, I, I think the, the, the key thing for me was I want to make this re relevant to everyone, not just a book for Muslims, but a book also uh, relevant to non-Muslims, not only relevant to Manitobans, but also relevant to those who are outside Manitoba. And so that being the case, I, I have to, uh, you know, skip many of the uh, minute details and and if necessary I just put them in the appendix but uh, I, I try to focus on the general trends that everybody can relate to uh, you know even people who are not in Manitoba by reading the book they can say yeah 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 you know we have gone through this and it seems familiar that, that uh, you know as if they're re reading their own their own their own history and their own struggle so that was my objective, but I, as I said, it, it, it wasn't easy. I have to choose my words carefully and I have to revise and keep revising the book, try to think uh, in, uh, the, content of, of the, the content of the book from the point of view of an outsider and an insider. And uh, hopefully uh, I've come to a middle, a middle ground. Um, so um, I, I just remembered a question that I had. You know, just going going back to the the research and the the sources. Um, how long did it really take you to do all the research? I think um, you mentioned having to dive very deeply into um, the the newspapers and you know trying all these different search terms. And um, so uh, I um, I remember you said that you know you had to you have to try multiple different search terms. So um, just just for clarity, you know, um, over time, uh, throughout history, Muslims have been called many different names, um, uh, Mohammedan, um, like, what were the other ones, Mohammedan, uh, I've, I've heard us being called Islamic Canadian before, or um, there was another one, or, or Mohammedan was also constantly um, uh, spelled differently as well. Yeah. So that, that was always confusing as well. And it's obviously not a term that um, we Muslims, we, we, we like or want to be labeled as. Um, and I can, uh, so I'm just wondering how now, now that I think about it, it probably took you such a long time just to go through all of that. So, but, but in general, how long did the research part of the book take for you? Yeah, I mean, I mean, as, as you noted, I'm a, a full-time professional accountant. So that's what I do for a living. So this was a side project, uh, something I do in the evenings, sometimes something I do in the weekends. So it, I would say it took me about two years. So in terms of searching through the archives, it's just going back and, and forth again and again to the extent, you know, sometimes you might have gone through the same paper 10 times or more, but I think also one thing lead to another. So you find something and then that will lead you to another thing and, and so on and so forth, like any other research. So I think from that point of view, uh, yeah, it, 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 I have to go to the archives many, many times. And uh, every time I find something, then that leads to something and, and that was helpful. Uh, also, uh, as part of my research, I have used some of the available uh, literature. Uh, I don't know if you know about Richard Awid, in uh, Edmonton. He has written a book about the early Arab immigrants uh, who came from Lebanon, who were basically um, the first uh, Muslim settlers in, uh, in Manitoba. So his book was really very helpful. And also there are some research papers here and there that were also very, very helpful. Um, actually, that's a good point that you make in, in the book that you call Manitoba the the gateway, um, the gateway province for a lot of these very early um, Muslim settlers. I know a lot of them came as stayed in Manitoba for a little while and then moved. Uh, uh, some of them, not all, a lot of them, sorry, some of them and then would eventually move on to other provinces um, where they may have settled or, or something like uh, they went, or they sometimes they came back. So that was interesting um, to see. I really like this idea of Manitoba being this gateway, gateway province. Yeah. 
And then I guess another challenge was the uh, uh, the early Muslims, they changed their names. Yes. So it wasn't Muhammad, it wasn't Ahmed, it was totally, you know, anglicized names. So sometimes it makes it difficult to, to, to research. I mean, I could go and search by Ahmed and Muhammad, but that was not their typical name. So that added to the complexity of, uh, of searching through the archives. Uh, absolutely. I think um, um, uh, we we talked to uh, Murray Murray Hogben uh, not too long ago, and he he mentioned this exact problem too, um, where you know he was trying to search for people, but their names were were anglicized suddenly, and then you yeah. don't f and often you wouldn't find out until um, maybe they passed away, and then the obituary might have their real you know their real name in it or something, yeah. and. So uh, you know this, and uh, I think you mentioned in your book too that um, they that they anglicized it likely to fit into you know society at the time, um, and uh, and you make a distinction that you know it, it was it was uh, the new wave in the '60s and stuff where they didn't change their name. So those those folks, the '50s and '60s, were there. There was much easier to find, but anybody earlier, their names were completely. And a, and a lot of the examples we gave were just they're not even close to each <laughs> close to each other. So you might have a Muhammad and suddenly he's Joe or something like this. So um, yeah, so I can imagine that can be that that, that was probably very very difficult also. And yeah. um, so actually speaking of um, uh, you know we were talking a little bit more um, about the the content of the book and I wanted to um, comment on. Um, how you divided up your book, which was really interesting. I think I mentioned this to you before in our previous meeting, but I really like that you, um, you know, divided up by, you know, and here's the history, and then you tied uh, the themes from the history and the issues and the, and the conference and really focused uh, in on those. Um, uh, but even within the first part, just the history section, it's subdivided into uh, four four phases. Um, so I'm just wondering um, how you chose these divisions and uh, these sections within the history and and, and why. Well, I, I guess I, I tried to look at the milestones in the history of the community and try to use them, you know, as a guide to. Uh, subdividing the history because for a reader you know if you put everything in one bucket it will be difficult to 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 follow the the, the sequence so I, I thought maybe it's good to divide it into you know the years of foundation the years of exploring the years of you know establishing roots and so on and so forth so by dividing it that way i i thought the reader would have a much easier uh, you know, much easier navigation through the book. But for me as a guide, I try to look at the milestones in history and use them as a guide to divide the different uh, sections of, of this long history from, I mean, it's about 100 years history. Yeah. Or 120 years, sorry. Um, and yes, and, and just for, for context, um, so uh, phase one, if, I, if I'm... Getting this correctly, phase one was uh, was around um, you know the um, the influx of um, Muslims that came from the Levant, and uh, these were the ones that changed their name, unfortunately, and were harder yeah. to harder to locate. Yeah. Um, so uh, they they came from uh, you know today's Syria and Lebanon. Um, oftentimes, I think you mentioned because uh, to escape um, uh, conscription, and um, this. The second, uh, the second phase was um, uh, the World War One and the Great Depression, where uh, there was not as many Muslims coming into Manitoba at the time because of immigration laws. Um, and then following that, you know, uh, following World War Two, you know, we see the restrictions easing, and this is the third phase where there's a large numbers of uh, folks coming to Manitoba. This is also around the time when. Um, Oh, I forgot what it was called, but the immigration, the point system or the. Yeah, yeah. the point system. Yeah. Yeah. So when um, uh, it was it, there was no more discrimination against race or color, I believe. Yeah. Um, and then finally, um, 
you know, you you make a distinction about, you know, the last phase being after 9-11, uh, so the aftermath of 9-11, we're still, um, our, I think we're still technically in the fourth phase then yeah. at the moment, okay. Um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I was just saying, so for me and for me as a reader, I, I really like things divided like that, like as you said, um, it, it made things a lot, made, it made things make a lot more sense uh, yeah. as I was reading it to understand um, where the differences are, where the themes came, uh, sorry, where the milestones are, where the changes came for this community itself. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought here. Um, actually, since we're, we are talking about the uh, the the history. I'm um, I'm wondering if there are if if there are any like specific stories or any key individuals or interesting interesting um, anecdotes or, or or whatnot that you that you'd like to share with us. Are there any things that you'd like any parts of the book that you'd like to highlight? Um, well, in terms of individuals, there are many individuals that uh, we can talk about. But one one specific person I would like to talk about is Ahmed Awad. Ahmed Awad. And the reason I, I want to talk about him is that he was uh, one of the first to arrive in Manitoba. He came in 1904 and he, he, he lived in Manitoba for about 20 years and then later he moved to Edmonton. Now this person, when he came to Manitoba, he was about 19 years old. So basically in, in his late teens, uh, illiterate, no education, no skills, uh, doesn't know English, uh, basically, you know, poor. And so he has to start from scratch. And it's amazing that within a short period of time of his arrival, he was able to open uh, a store in Winnipeg. And then later he moved to Edmonton where he opened uh, more stores and became a very well established businessman. Uh, his wife, in fact, was an employee working in his store, uh, Mary, and they, they had about 16 children. Uh, and, and, and when he left uh, Brandon, there was, you know, a short article about him. And this is in 19, I think, 27, uh, saying, you know, Ahmed Awad, uh, the man, uh, Ahmed Awad, left Winnipeg, a man known for his business success and integrity. And, and I find that very, uh, very, very interesting, you know, a person who really starts from scratch and being successful in business. And in fact, he was sponsor of some sports in, in Brandon at that time. And that he's, you know, recognized by the newsletter at that time. Uh, and, and, he, and he was not an exception. There were many others like him, young teenagers came from Lebanon, no, no skills whatsoever. And, and a good number of them, some of them went into, into to farming, but a good number of them went into business. And, and that helped them to avoid discrimination. You know, when you seek employment and when you are under, under the, uh, you know, the control of, of, of others now, but you, if you are, uh, doing your own business, you're free. So, so I think I found that very interesting. Uh, Ahmed Awad was one of them. And, and there are, of course, many, if you have a chance to read the book, but he was not an exception in a sense that most of them were very resi resilient, very hardworking. And uh, Hamdan has spoken about their uh, resilience and, and, and their hard work. Um, yeah, I remember. I remember his story in the book. Um, so, what, was he? Um, did he start in Winnipeg or Brandon? I think. I think uh, you mentioned that there are at least two cities outside, like outside of Winnipeg, that had um, a large Muslim population. Brandon, I think Hodgson was the other one. Um, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean Winnipeg is the capital. Right. And at that time, Winnipeg was the third largest city in Canada after Montreal and Toronto. And they used to call her, they, they used to call Winnipeg the, uh, the Chicago of the North. So it was a booming city. 
Now, for some reason, most of those Muslim immigrants did not stay in Winnipeg. They went to Brandon, uh, which was uh, one of the largest cities in the prairie at that time. So there was a good concentration of Muslims in Brandon. Most of them, or a good chunk of them, were in business. Uh, there were farmers. Uh, Hudson is a small village. And in that village, uh, there was few of them. And today, the oldest uh, Muslim family in Manitoba is, uh, is, is found in, in Hudson. It's, it's a large family. Of course, the, uh, the, the younger generation don't want to be farmers, but uh, still some of the elders are still in that city, in that, in that village. Wow, so um, I, I know you talk about you know, s- some people moving into Manitoba and leaving, but there's still lots of families I, I see there that, who still, whose roots are still in those, in those uh, towns and cities and villages that yeah. Uh, yeah, their ancestors came into. Yeah, wow. okay. yeah so, so the first one to come from that family, he came in 1914. All his children were born here, and then they, they all passed away. There is only one who is left, who is now, I think, is about 92 or 94, but very active and very strong memory. And he was interviewed by myself, and even Mary Hogburn did interview him. Yeah. So, um, so they didn't mention why they didn't stay in Winnipeg. Uh, they just, you know, that nobody, you didn't get an idea of why they chose. Hudson or Brandon? Was it just the, because of the farming? Well, uh, the reason they chose was Brandon, there is no exact reason, mm-hmm. uh, but a professor in Brandon University thinks maybe that that's because they, they were, that would make them close to Saskatchewan. Uh, her theory is that in Saskatchewan, there was a strong established Muslim community. Mm-hmm. And by being in Brandon, they will have a chance to be closer to that, that's her theory, but still it's something that needs to be researched more. But in terms of those who went to Hudson, I mean, there were farmers all all, all over the the province, but they went to Hudson because at that time the government offered, uh, you know, new immigrants uh, a piece of land, I mean, a large section of the land, if they were willing to go and farm it and, and establish. So, so they accepted that and, and they went to there and they decided to stay. Some, some of them, did, I mean, there were many farmers who left the, pro, the province during the, uh, the depression, uh, lots of them. Mm-hmm. But the Abbas family, they stay put and they stayed there. And now they have very, very large, it's a, it's a large family, one of the largest families in the province. And I think uh, now that you mentioned the Abbas, uh, the Abbas family, you, uh, I think there was a, I don't know why I remember this sentence, but I, I, you mentioned that um, I think two of the boys in that family almost went uh, to um, went to war for, I think, for the First World War or the Second, second World War? Second World War, they were called for conscription and uh, for to the army. Mm-hmm. Uh, so one of them, uh, I think one of them was not, uh, fit, uh, mm-hmm. he had some health challenges, and the other one I think was was uh, exempted because uh, his his parents needed him, uh, if I if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah, that they were they were called. There was a third one, but uh, he was younger. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, I I just thought that was an interesting it was an interesting uh, point because I don't think a lot of people know that there are many there were a few Muslims that did. Um, you know, at least the, at least I know about the First World War. There were a, a, yeah. a few Muslims that were, um, you know, that did fight for Canada at the time. Um, so I, I did also want to. So that's the. So I that was the first uh, part of the book, which was the history. And I think um, I really I really enjoyed the second part where you kind of went over. Um, you gave it like an overview of some of the the issues um, and then the subsequent like resilience and how the community dealt with the issues that came, you know, kind of attacked them. Um, and uh, particularly, I did want to talk about uh, Islamophobia, especially because you do focus on that a little bit in the second section. Um, I, I just wonder if there's any like, you know, points in throughout, you know, Manitoba's history where they uh, um, 
where they were you know, faced with Islamophobia, are there any key stories or uh, key key moments or events that um, we could share with us today? And you know, and how did the the community react to those uh, those moments? Well, I guess Manitobans pride themselves for being friendly. So to a certain extent, you know, when you see what's happening in Quebec and seeing what happened in London, Ontario, uh, I think Manitoba, you know, is, 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 is very welcoming and, and very friendly. And, but, you know, Islamophobia is a national uh, problem and you will find it everywhere in Canada. Uh, yes, we did have many uh, instances of uh, Islamophobia, and I have mentioned many of them in the book. Uh, they were definitely unfortunate. Uh, our mosque, for example, was attacked a number of times. Uh, there were very hateful articles published in the main uh, newsletter. Uh, you know, there were even a, there was a conference that I mentioned specifically. In the, 19, in the 1990s, before even September 11, you know, titled the, uh, the threat of Islamic terrorism to, to North America, which the community objected very strongly. And, you know, when the Salman Rushdie affair happened, there, there were all, so many instances. But one thing I would say is that uh, these Islamophobic instances, unfortunately, I mean, they were uh, hurting, but they were also good for the community. Uh, you, so you see, in the, as a community, sometimes we were close to ourselves. And there were among us that who would say, you know what, no, we should not be voting, we should not be participating, we should not be, uh, you know, engaging with the non-Muslims and so on and so forth. So these instances really open the doors of our community. People were reaching out to us. They were f f calling us and sending letters of support. So that helped our community uh, open its doors and reach out to the different segments of the community, to the media, to the church groups, to the civic society. And, and now it's, it's, it's amazing that our community have so many friends that anybody engaged in any act of Islamophobia, uh, you know, more than us, they will be condemning it and, uh, and they will be supporting us. So when we had the vigil for the attack on the uh, Quebec mosque and the London incident, there were more, more non-Muslims than Muslims attending that event. So, so we have uh, learned to uh, work together with other Manitobans. And I think uh, our community is, is, is fairly sophisticated now and well connected with the larger society. So that was one good outcome of uh, you know, the, the Islamophobic pressure. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the, some of the things that happened and some of the things that said, it, it's hurtful especially our young people sometimes, you know, it's, it's really difficult for them. Um, I, I also want, so I wanted to ask you as well, um, how Islamophobia, um, I, I don't know if, if this came up with any of, you, any of your interviews, but um, were there any instances, you know, um, of Islamophobia or, or Islamophobic like acts um, that uh, your interviewees may have brought up, you know, the ones, those folks that, um, you know, were, the, that were here for a very long time or, you know, came in the 50s and 60s, you know, I'm just, I'm wondering how Islamophobia may have looked like back then for them or if, if they even realized it or um, if they didn't, you know, if they experienced anything like that. Um... Yeah, I, I guess young people in particular, university students, uh, th they did go through some difficult period. You know, I mentioned in my book that there were three young people from the University of Manitoba who disappeared. And it is believed that they went probably to Afghanistan and that they were, uh, they joined a terrorist group. and. Uh, that was publicly announced and the RCMP made a public announcement about formally charging them. Now, because they were in the university and because they had uh, probably some friends, 
you know, the scissors were just, you know, running left and right, interviewing this person and that person. And uh, of course, they were not very discreet and that created some kind of panic among the young people and they felt somewhat uh, unjustifiably targeted. In addition, of course, to the media talking about, you know, radical imams and mosques radicalizing young people, which was not the case. I mean, these uh, young individuals, probably they were in, radicalized through the internet, so not through the community. But that creates, you know, uh, a momentum for uh, anti-Semitic uh, sentiments, which the community has, has to deal with. Uh, but the good thing is, you know, as I said, the community has, is, is more sophisticated. We have very good relationship with the media. I mean, media generally is very friendly to our community. Uh, they come and cover our events and they know now who, who to talk to. And in the past they, they, they would, you know, scramble now, but they come to the mosque, so they, they know the, the key leaders and, and figures. Politicians are always in our mosques. We have something called Fodorama. They would be the first one to attend these events. So yeah, some, you know, something that could be, uh, you know, learned from for, for other communities to, to work very closely with, with others. Um, so, so I wonder also how um, I guess you know the you know the 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 pioneers I suppose who who started off in Brandon and um, and in Hodgson um, how were they welcomed were they did they experience um, Islamophobia or any sort of um, uh, discrimination uh, when they first came out in the early 1900s. Do you know if, if did any of the, you know, the, the people that you spoke to, or at least they're, I suppose you, you spoke to their descendants, of course, um, did they mention anything about their parents or grandparents um, not feeling welcomed in, in Manitoba? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the early people I interviewed was the Abbas family in uh, Hudson. And you know, I, I mentioned that in my book, but their uh, description of their neighbors is, is, is very positive. They said they were supportive of us and they gave us all the, uh, you know, the, the, the necessary help to, to, to establish ourselves. And not only that, because the Abbas family stayed in Hudson during the depression, uh, they talk how the, the their neighbors who were mostly uh, Christians were very supportive of them. So they do not talk of uh, ex any negative experience uh, being in that in in that part of Manitoba. Uh, in terms of others who were in uh, Brandon, uh, you know, information is is not as readily available. But there was one instance, I mean, I, I don't know if it is an instance of uh, you know, Islamophobia or it was an instance of robbery. There was a 19 year old Syrian peddler who was uh, attacked and, uh, but it looks like more of a robbery incident rather than Islamophobia. But as also, as I mentioned, the media generally was ignorant about Islam uh, and, and uh, and the way they talked about Islam and Muslims basically shows an absolute uh, lack of any, you know, uh, any basic knowledge of what Islam stands for and what Muslims believe in. Yeah, yeah, I've, absolutely. I think um, I, just the fact that they can't even get our, our label correctly <laughs> correctly tells you as well, um, you know, more than enough about you know, the media. I'm sure there wasn't a lot of um, talk about Muslims in Manitoba at the time, anyway. Um, so, actually, so speaking about you know the, the community, uh, and you mentioned this, and I, I mentioned this in your biography. You mentioned this a little bit earlier before, but you are very, very integral to Manitoba's Muslim community, its growth, and uh, it's um, where we know where it stands today. Um, and but but you do but you also mentioned this earlier that you didn't want to that you wanted to have an objective voice in this book. So um, but I think you're very humble, and I wish that uh, I you know that I could 
hear more about your own contributions um, uh, to the history as well. Um, I think uh, the only the only way I knew that you were president of the Manitoba Muslim uh, Association was first when you mentioned it, and second when I saw the appendix of. Uh, presidents, <laughs> the list of presidents that you made the table, and I saw you were in there and I said, oh, I didn't know you were president. Uh, so, um, yes, yeah, so I, I really wanted to give you this space also to, for you to talk about, um, you know, your experiences in, in Manitoba as well and being part of the Muslim community and it and uh, if you uh, and I, I um, and I imagine, obviously, you're still part of the of the Manitoba's Muslim community as well, and okay. and you know your your transition from present and until now. Yeah. Well, I guess my involvement with the community began from the first year I, I arrived in Winnipeg, and my focus mostly was on mentoring young people. That was something I was and I'm still passionate about. Uh, so I've been uh, organizing uh, study groups for, for young people, and I still do that. Uh, so mentoring young people, this was something I've done for the longest time. Uh, similarly, I have been also in volunteer capacity, uh, giving Friday sermons and uh, lecturing in different community uh, events and uh, conferences and, and forums and uh, and to the best of my ability, I try to present an understanding of Islam that is balanced, moderate, relevant, and logical. Uh, I was also involved in uh, co-founding many different uh, projects, such as the Takaful Financial Assistance Fund, uh, establishing the Manitoba Muslim Magazine, I was part of the biggest uh, project undertaken by the community, building the Grand Mosque. Uh, <clears throat> I also played the role of advisor to the, uh, to the executives have been being along for a long time and also a reconciliator when you know, there are frictions within the community. Uh, but also I took a, a major uh, undertaking as president of Manitoba Islamic Association. Now, the time I took that position was uh, a very, very difficult time. Uh, our community went through a major conflict that went to the courts. And unfortunately, the, the Manitoba Islamic Association ended up being under receivership. So taking the uh, association from receivership and putting the house in order, that responsibility was put on my shoulder. It wasn't my choice, but it was a pressure from the community. Uh, I took over with great reluctance, but uh, I was happy that, uh, you know, it was a good group of young people of team around me. We managed to put the house in order and uh, the association now is uh, flourishing and in good shape. Uh, th thank you. Thank you for, for that. Um, I actually didn't know about some of the other organizations you mentioned that you were part of those uh, those as well. Um, so you've done so much and um, I mean, I'm not from Manitoba, but I, I can I can I, I know some people who are and they're very grateful from what I hear um, uh, from uh, with your contributions and how much work you how much you know, you know, how much of your effort, you know, your soul you put into the into the community. Um, so I did want to go to a question that I'm very, very curious about. And, and that is, you know, I, I, I know there's a, the book is very, you know, it, it, it has a lot of um, information in it. And um, you have really great appendices at the end where, you know, people can kind of uh, go, move, move on and learn more on their own time. Like you list a lot of publications and a, a lot of great resources people can go to and to learn more. Um, but I'm wondering if, um, if you had the time, I mean, you spent two, almost two, three years, I suppose, right, you know, creating this book, but if you had more time, if you, it, it, um, or, it, you know, if you had more resources, um, was there anything that you would, would have liked to dive more, you know, more deeply into? Was there anything you'd like to add to the book? Um, you know, what would you like, what would you have liked to include that uh, now that it's, now that you finished it and it's published? 
Yeah, I, I guess one of the, uh, in my book, I mentioned that one of the daughters of the early uh, immigrants to uh, Manitoba, she said that the, a, a good portion of our history or, the, or that history has been lost. So had I had enough time, I would have liked to spend more time uh, digging more uh, and trying to uh, unveil as much uh, information as possible. I, I think to a certain extent, I, I managed to gather good information, but I believe there is still a lot to be discovered. So if I would have time, certainly I would have, um, you know, delved deeper into the Muslim history uh, in the early time. Uh, we don't know even who was the first person to come. The theory is it was early 1900, but it could be earlier. So that's an area which I would think, uh, you know, I would have uh, spent more time. Uh, the other area, I mean, I have a chapter where I talk about the relation of Muslims to the indigenous people. Uh, maybe that area also I would uh, have spent more time uh, researching and maybe even reaching to the indigenous communities in case uh, they have anything uh, to do with Muslims. I know early Muslims as peddlers, they, they went to the north, some of them learned the Cree language, some of them married indigenous women, and their relationship was much positive than the relationship of those who came from Europe. So that's an area that I would maybe have spent more time analyzing and investigating. And also on community issues, perhaps there were some areas that maybe needed more focus, more more time, more uh, analysis. But uh, yeah, but you know, always as an author, you hope you think that you could do more. So definitely, there is a lot to be done. Oh, and of course, uh, like the, the book is absolutely like you know. You know, one of a kind. It definitely, I, I like to I'd like to call it a stepping stone um, for for more you know for more work that, like you said, that you still needs to be done on on this topic. Um, so I guess my my final kind of question before we move on to the Q and A is, um, if if any community member, if anybody, an academic, a researcher, you know, wanted to learn more. Um, you know, what would you suggest that they consult um, or who actually even people because of course you interviewed people as well. Um, what, what are some sources and resources uh, outside from your book, of course, that you think uh, people should consult to learn more about Manitoba's Muslim history. Uh, well, I guess uh, the reaching out to the association. I mean, we, I'm, I'm, I'm working or I'm trying to convince the association that's time that they put their archives together in a systematic way, that they try to reach to uh, the different uh, early uh, leaders and their families to, to collect whatever documentations they have. So I hope they will heed to my call and take this seriously. So, but I would say that would be a starting point. Um, I've created a website uh, where I'm trying to make it uh, an important resource for researchers. I have uh, the copies of the Manitoba Muslim Magazine going back to 2009. Uh, the magazine was established in 1996. So I still have to put more. Uh, it's, it's still an evolving website. It's in some ways similar to the I history of uh, Brother Hassan uh, for Manitoba. So that's a website still under, and you know, I'm still working on it, but I'm hoping to make it more resourceful. And of course, the, the local newsletters that are, are also uh, helpful, uh, but, Unfortunately, the resources are still limited. I think we need to do more work to create more, more resources, uh, whether it's Manitoba or elsewhere. Um, I'm really happy to hear that you know you are pushing for um, the uh, the MIA to to you know document you know, sorry organize their archives and their under uh, documents. Um, because that'll be very, very important um, for for any any future research on on this topic. Absolutely. Um, okay, so 
we are right on time on on, on schedule for uh, the q a actually um yes so we have a couple of questions here um that came up while we were talking so i'm going to go back to them first and then um, if anybody else has questions that are you know that are not in the chat and that you'd like to um turn off your turn on your microphone and ask directly please go ahead otherwise and anybody can ask questions in the chat and, uh, and i'm going to go through in order uh, some of these questions so um the first one is uh, in addition to the collect uh, you know collecting the narratives of seniors and those in uh, in their in their network did you also search uh, existing archives to explore earlier histories if so, can you please share some tips as to how you conducted such archival research and what challenges did you face? You kind of answered this question within our, our discussion, but um, are there any tips or um, that you'd like to give and what are, and what are some challenges you faced? Yeah, I, I guess I try to reach out to the local two universities and see whatever I can find in, in their archives. I try to reach to the Manitoba archives locally and even to the archives of the city of uh, Winnipeg. Um, and of course, the archives of the libraries. And I think the archives of the libraries were the most helpful. It's, it's extensive. They have data from Statistics Canada. They have uh, all the different newsletters going back to the, uh, you know, 1800s. So, I found that the most resourceful, but I did reach out. There was some, some information I managed to gather from the University of Manitoba about the Muslim Student Associations. But as I said, uh, one has to try to reach to every, every group and every institution. Uh, some of them are very helpful. Some of them are very slow to respond. Uh, I reached out to Stats Canada and they were very helpful. I mean, I, I was really impressed that when I send them a question, they would respond and they would send me uh, the data available or they would give me direction where to find information. So that, that was also a very important resource. Okay, so the, the next, I hope that answers um, your question. So the next, the next question is, uh, when reaching out to the descendants of the pioneers, uh, did you experience any reluctance on their part? Um, were they hesitant or were they less willing to be identified as Muslims, for example? Yeah, was there, was there any reluctance? Yeah, well, I guess, I, I, I mean, I haven't come across anybody who said no, but uh, I came across some, you know, who said, yeah, we'll respond to you and, and never did. And I have to keep reminding them until I finally gave up. So uh, it was a little bit disappointing with some of them, but there were a few who were forthcoming. And uh, uh, of course there was a limitation to how much they know, uh, but they tried their best. So I would say it was a mixed bag. Some of them, they didn't see much importance to that. They didn't really take it seriously. So yeah, we'll, we'll get back to you. Some of them just ignored the email, uh, but there were a few who responded. So like any other research, whenever you, you, you approach people, not everybody is forthcoming. Some of them, they are not interested. Some of them don't see any value in what you're doing. Uh, some of them, they have nothing to, to provide. Uh, so a mix of, 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 every, of every type of people. Uh, the next question is, uh, do you feel that a broader Muslim identity identity was a preferred identifier in Manitoba? Uh, were there groups who chose not to participate because of a stronger identification with national or regional identity as opposed to religion? Uh, how prevalent were uh, sectarian divides within Manitoba's Muslim community? Um, and how may we delve into such dynamics, communal dynamics? So um, let me, I'll read this again, because I think there's a couple of questions in here. So, so first of all, do you feel that a broader Muslim identity was a preferred identifier in Manitoba? You know, were, groups, were, were there groups who chose not to participate because of 
uh, stronger, you know, identifying more strongly with national or regional identities as, as opposed to Muslimness or Islam? Yeah. Well, the early Muslims who came in the 1900s, uh, they were predominantly from Lebanon, so ethnically they were all the same. In terms of their religious affiliations, uh, there was a good section of them who were Druze, uh, maybe a smaller number who were Shia, and there were also Sunnis among them. But because at that time they did not establish any institution, uh, probably you know the uh, the, the sectarian divide or uh, you know conflicts were were not evident among them. Maybe everybody just lived on their own, but nothing clear in terms of conflict. But those who came from the 1950s and 60s, uh, predominantly they came from India and Pakistan, and there were some from the Caribbean islands. Um, now, at that stage, you know, most of them, they were professionals, they were students, and uh, they were so smaller in number. So uh, they, they, they worked together, regardless of their ethnicity, and even the, there was a small percentage of the Shia among them. And, the, you know, the, this is Shia, or this is Sunnah, or this, that was not anything in, in, into their consideration. And I mentioned this in the book, they worked together as Muslims, in establishing the Manitoba Islamic Association. But then uh, by the 1970s and 80s, you know, it was, was what was happening in, uh, in the Middle East and with the Iranian revolution and the tensions that followed, uh, the Shias started uh, pulling themselves or, or they were pushed out, whatever you want to call it, from the main organization and uh, they started working on their own to establish their own association. Uh, so basically you had that, that, that early uh, split, uh, but then you have, you know, I mean, just to use the, the term people use, you know, the, the friction between those who saw themselves liberals and between those who saw themselves women, uh, sorry, uh, liberal, on issues, you know, uh, the role of women and uh, the, the space of women in the mosque and, and, and so on and so forth. These kinds of uh, fragmentations start to happen. But I would say, by and large, because the Manitoba Islamic Association was established uh, as a group, everybody participated, uh, that helped the community to, to, to work together. So. Uh, ethnic segmentation and uh, factional grouping is not as prevalent as it is in, in other places. But now we are growing. And when you grow in number, then that's where the challenge, uh, the challenge comes. And, uh, you know, when the communities start to grow, they think, you know what, we need to have our own ethnic mosque. So that's a challenge we have to face and manage in the future. But as it stands right now, we are more of a very diverse and very open uh, community. If you go to our mosque, most of our mosques, especially the main mosque, or if you come to our Eid, you can't identify as, uh, identify as, as a specific uh, ethnic. Uh, we were just every group, every, every segment of life. And, and, and that's in a way positive. But as I said, as we grow, we'll see uh, what direction we take. So the, the, next, the next question is, uh, how can Muslims integrate into the society of Manitoba in the shadow of Islamophobia? Um, so this is a tough question. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess the, the challenge is, you know, to uh, integrate, be part of the, of the larger society, be true Manitobans who care about the province and uh, who have a sense of belonging, but at the same time also maintain our Islamic uh, identity and our Islamic personality. Now, in my thoughts, and I've mentioned this in the book, uh, uh, perhaps what we need is first to have a clear understanding of Islam itself. When we mix Islam with culture, uh, that becomes problematic. Uh, 
For example, I know some people who would object to celebrating Canada Day. They say this is a non-Muslim holiday, but they have no problem celebrating, you know, the, the national day of uh, their mother country, wherever that mother country is. So I, I think having a more uh, balanced, authentic, logical, progressive understanding of Islam, that will go a long way. Because without that understanding, you will have people who would say, you know, let's not allow them into the mosque. Let's not vote. Uh, let's not do this. Let's not do this. So with a clear understanding and authentic understanding, we can interact with a larger community uh, with a sense of confidence, knowing what our faith is, knowing what the clear um, boundaries are. And at the same time, also, when we embrace our Canadian or Manitoban identity, uh, that would also bring a different understanding that we are not here just uh, as aliens or as outsiders. No, this is our country. This is our place. And we share uh, common, not only common land, but common concern. So I think a, a paradigm shift uh, on both our understanding of Islam and also our understanding of our place in, 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 in this particular place, I, I think is very important. Uh, you know, I remember in the past, probably if you go to the mosque Friday sermons, you didn't hear much about uh, Canadian issues, but now you hear the khatibs talking about standing with the indigenous people. You hear the khatibs talking about the importance of civic engagement and talking about mental illness. So relating Islam to the local uh, issues and struggles, I think that that shows that we as a community are maturing and finding our, our rightful place in the, in the society. So I think we have uh, time for one more, one or two more questions. Um, the next one is, uh, how does the story of Muslims in Canada, uh, sorry, Muslims in Manitoba echo or differ from broader trends in Canada, uh, broader trends in the history of Muslims in Canada? Uh, personally, I don't think it's much different. Uh, you know, the, 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 it's the same story how immigrants come and settle and, and find their way. And then you have the pain of growing as a community, you know, the ethnic frictions and, uh, and trying to uh, establish institutions, build a mosque, build a school, and all the different issues. So I think the history itself, there is a common trend across, uh, across the board. That's why I, I, I said in the beginning that even though my book is about Muslims in Manitoba, uh, anybody who reads the book would feel, you know what, uh, the book sounding like talking about the history of their community because of similarities. So yeah, so definitely there is a trend and that trend I think uh, overall uh, shows that we Muslims are taking deeper roots in, in our in our country, but I think there is another challenge and that's keeping the second generation engaged. I think that's one of the challenges that we see across the board. I mentioned that in my book, that second generation with, when it comes to leadership of the community is, 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 is nowhere to be seen. And, and I don't think that's a healthy thing. So this, this last question is kind of related to the last one, but um, so are Manitoba Muslims still in, engrossed in integration discourses or do they frame their Canadian Muslim experiences and challenges differently today? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, are Manitoba Muslims still engrossed in integration discourses or do they frame their Canadian Muslim experiences and challenges differently? Well, you see the, the community itself, even though it's one community, but you have different segments. You have people who came to Manitoba in the 1950s, and you have people who came to Manitoba five years ago. And, and, and what's interesting is that the majority of the community came, you know, maybe in the last 20 years. So, so that creates its, its own challenge. Those who came earlier, they are well more established 
and they are more in tune with the, with the local reality. Uh, those who came more, more recently, the, there is a there is an adjustment that, that they have to go through. So what happens in the end is you have two pull factors. One is the pull factor of those who are new to the to the community and who are so connected to the to their mother country, and they have some ways to go to to really adapt and adjust. And also to those who have been here. So there's always a push and, and pull factor that we we have to struggle with. But at the core, I would say uh, our community has uh, is, is very well integrated in terms of its core, and uh, and uh, is, is very well engaged. And as I said, we have a very good working relationship with with the larger society, which is positive. But as I said, you know. There are always newcomers coming, and with every newcomer, it's a new challenge. They have to go through a learning curve, and uh, that's a reality we have to live with. All right, so uh, so thank you for everyone for all those uh, wonderful questions. Um, we that that's all the questions I see, and it actually again we're very much on time. Um, but that's the so that's the end of the the Q and A. Um, I just wanted to thank first of all everyone for joining um, today. This is a slide uh, with some of our information and you know how you can get uh, into contact with me. And also um, the Manitoba Muslims website is on here as well. Please check it out for uh, information on the book. But also as uh, Ismail mentioned, like we all, he also has uh, a lot of resources on there as well about uh, Manitoba's Muslim community and history as well. Um, and uh, yes, and please uh, get a copy of the book when you get a chance as well. You can, there's links on that website uh, to um, uh, purchase the book. Uh, and at last, finally, thank you so much, uh, Ismail Mukhtar, for your time today. Uh, we really, really appreciate you being here and um, talking to us about uh, the, the book. Um, uh, this this uh, entire event um, was recorded, so we're going to make sure that it's um, on our YouTube page and then we'll be able to send that to you as well for, for anybody who, if you wanted to share it with anybody else, especially those that couldn't make it here today. So again, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. And nice talking to all of you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Have a good night, everyone.